Now, the title of my sermon this morning <coughs> is Show Thyself a Man. So I just wanted to focus on the first couple of verses there when David is charging his son Solomon to be a man. So I'm preaching this today because it's just an exhortation to the fathers today to be a man, to show thyself a man, and to be an actual godly and biblical man, to set a right example for the next generation. Now, we see here in 1 Kings 2, at the beginning, when David charges his son, and we ought to do that to our children as well, to charge our sons to show themselves a man. You know, that's a way to say, like, be a man. You know, be a godly man. 1 Kings 2, 2, now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, so this is on David's deathbed, I go the way of all the earth. So he's saying, I'm about to pass away. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Now notice, when he says, be a man, show yourself a man, it's not just anybody's idea of what it means to be a man, right? What, what he's saying here is when you show yourself a man, that you walk in the ways of God, you keep the charge of the Lord, you're obedient to God's commandments, you walk in his ways, you keep his statutes, his commandments and his judgments, and his testimonies. Because you know what? The world has an idea of what manliness is, and God has an idea of what manliness is. Because manliness is. what does the world consider manliness these days? If you think of what the world considers as manliness, you don't have to look any further than, you know, sports these days, or the UFC. The people that are there, supposedly the manliest athletes and the manliest fighters, what sort of people are these people? And this is what the world considers to be manly. People that are brawlers, people that are drunkards, you know, people that are all flashy, people that are immodest, people that are fornicators and adulterers. You know, how, how, how many times do you see today, oh, to be a man, you're getting all the ladies, you get, you're going to you know, sleep with whoever you want. Well, according to God, that's not manliness. This is not something we should be glorifying or thinking uh, you know, something that is something to be pursued. So the world has an idea of what is manliness, but we want to be men in the eyes of God, and being a man in the eyes of God is being a godly person. So I want to talk about five different areas where you can show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. So number one, if you're going to show yourself a man... First of all, you got to look like a man, right? you got to look like a man. Now, the Bible doesn't give specifics. So the principle is there that men ought to look like men and women ought to look like women. So yeah, it requires a bit of wisdom, a bit of common sense of, hey, what does it mean to be a man and what does it be, mean to be a woman? But the point I'm making here is, you know, if a guy is looking a little bit girly, Right, whatever that means in a society, that is a sin according to the Bible, to be effeminate. Look here in 1 Corinthians 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Look at this, nor effeminate. So what does it mean to be effeminate? See, when you're a lady and you're ladylike, you're being feminine. That's a good thing. That's a good attribute for a woman. But when you're a man and you're effeminate, you know, you're acting like a girl, you have girly mannerisms, you dress like a girl, you talk like a girl, that's being effeminate. So men in the Bible need to not only, you know, behave like men, but look like men as well. So what are some ways you can look like a man? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11, it says here, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have a long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So a lot of, um, you know, a lot of Muslims try and go to 1 Corinthians 11 to try and prove, oh, you know, we're meant to have our head covered, and that's why women have the covering, and that's why Mary had the covering, and they say, well, that's who we're copying. You know, they try and get Christians on board by saying, hey, you know, like we're like Mary, you know, had a covering, and they don't even know if she had a covering. They say, well, we're dressing like Mary. 
and they say the Bible says you should have a covering, but you know, if you just read down to verse 15, the Bible is very clear that the covering that is given to a woman is her hair. So people who believe in actually putting a covering over long hair, you'd be then covering your covering. So it's, uh, yeah, so the hair is given for a covering. So there's no point covering the covering because the hair is covering the head, right? So here it says, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. So notice it's not a sin to have long hair, right? Because if you had took the Nazarite vow, then you would grow your hair out. But the point I'm making here is when a man has long hair, it brings shame to him. It's something that's showing he's being afflicted. That's why the, the Nazarite vow. So just like you wouldn't glory in wearing sackcloth, you wouldn't glory in like putting ash on your head and you're showing that you're like afflicting yourself. It's the same with a man has long hair. But see, when a woman has long hair, that's something she can glory in, right? It's a, the hair is a glory. It's actually something that makes her look better and it, it adds to her appearance. But a man, no. So if a man has long hair and he's like, you know, flowing it around, he's tying it up in all fancy hairdos and taking care of it, this is a feminine attribute to have. Right, so long hair on a man can be a problem, right? If it's something that is, you know, he's trying to use to make him look more beautiful. You know, this is not something men do. This is something women do. Women have long hair to make themselves look beautiful. Men may grow their hair out if they're afflicting themselves. And, you know, and obviously if, they just, if they're not afflicting themselves, then it's just bringing shame on them because the Bible says you shouldn't even be praying publicly with your hair covered, with long hair. What else? The way you dress as well. Look at 1 Timothy 2. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now the thing about this passage, when it talks about you know, guys saying, oh, you know, do I have broidered hair, gold, pearls or expensive clothing? The thing about this passage is it's directed at women. So women are the ones that are usually concerned about the way they look and looking pretty and doling themselves up. But nowadays you have men doing that. You have men doll, yeah, yeah, you have men makeup. You know, you know, men, I don't know, I don't know if some men are like taking those like Instagram selfies and like they're putting like all the, the skin smoothing on it, all that sort of stuff. But you know, if you're a man, you need to dress like a man as well. So look like a man, have your hair like a man, act like a man, you know, don't have the limp wrists and all that sort of stuff. And, and you know, this is one thing, you know, in Asian culture is, is very prevalent where just like you, you see a guy and he's not a homosexual, but, but he's, he's acting like a girl. They're all like girly and they talk really girly and you're just like, ah, man up. You know, it's, 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 it's like disgusting seeing men like this. It's like, well, if you're not a homosexual, why are you acting like one? You know, so shamefacedness, surprise. So this is directed at women. So men should not really be, you know, dressing with expensive clothing, doing their hair all fancy, having excess jewellery and all that. And this is something even women should be aware of, right? But you can see here that it's directed at women, not at men. So one way you can show yourself a man is in your appearance, how you have your hair cut, how you behave, how you dress. Second one, show yourself a man by being faithful. Faithfulness is an attribute of a godly man. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 20, verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. I always like to compare this passage, you know, in Proverbs 31, where it says, you know, a, a woman, you know, uh, a vir who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. So virtuous women are very rare, but a faithful man is also rare. What is faithful? Somebody that can be trusted, trustworthy, loyal, consistent, diligent. And look at this. Most men, it says here in Proverbs 20, I always find this right. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. You, you ask a guy to talk about himself. Every guy talks, thinks he's top of the world, thinks he's the best, right? Everyone talks themselves up. But what it's saying here, a faithful man who can find, who can actually put action to their words, who's actually a man of their word, somebody that can be trusted, so trustworthy, be reliable, have integrity 
You know, be diligent when you go about the things that you do. A faithful man also can mean being faithful to your spouse. You know, being faithful to your spouse, being there for your spouse, taking care of her, making her feel loved, making her feel special. You know, it's not just, yeah, maybe you're not committing adultery, but do you, do you like look at pornography? Do you look at other girls? Do you like, you know, is your attention somewhere else? We need to be faithful, not only physically, but faithful in the heart as well. So a faithful man is one that is faithful in his, to his wife in all areas. Look what it says here in Numbers 12. We have a few examples of faithful men in the Bible. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. So we have Moses here as an example of somebody who is faithful. And why? I mean, when you read through the Bible, how many times do you read that phrase, as the Lord commanded Moses? He did this, as the Lord commanded Moses. This is why he was faithful, because he did what God asked of him. Joshua 11, verse 15. Joshua as well. Look at this. He was a faithful man as well. And as the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. And so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. You know, we have a limited amount of time in our life, right? You can't do everything you want to do in life. So some things have to be left undone. But what is being left undone? Is it what the Lord has commanded you? that you are, being, you are leaving undone? Because this is what people do. They get so busy, and rather than leaving nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded them, they leave the things undone of the things that the Lord has commanded them. You don't have time to read your Bible. You're not spending time in prayer with your family and on your own. You're not spending time coming to church. You know, you're too busy. You're leaving, the, you're forsaking the assembly to go do something else that was not commanded of you, and yet you're leaving what is commanded of you undone. So here, Joshua is a great example where it says here, Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Because you know what? Joshua probably had a lot that he wanted to do in his life, and he couldn't get it all done, but he made sure what the God had commanded him through Moses did get done. And that's the attribute, that's an attribute of a faithful man. Look here in Matthew 25, we just uh, read quickly through the parable of the talents. And this is later, so not the whole parable, but just at the end. But what I want to show you here is how people have, they're faithful, where they work proactively, even when they're not supervised. You know, they have initiative, they're proactive about things. After a long time, so you remember he doles out the one talent, two talents, five talents. After a long time, so you see there's some faithfulness there, there's some consistency over a long period of time. Because some people, they get excited, they start well, and they're not faithful because they drop out very easily. This is why Christianity is a lifetime pursuit. It's not something you do after a couple of months, and I tried that, and it's done, no. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents and uh, came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Well, I have gained two talents, two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then there's obviously the last example too. But my point today is not the parable in and of itself. My point in this parable is you see the faithful servants took initiative, they were proactive, they were faithful, even unsupervised. When the Lord had went away, they still got to work. They're not like the mice that play when the cat's away, right? Faithful. 
even when you look at the parallel passage of the parable of the pounds, you see here, he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So likewise, Jesus is away. We are meant to be faithful servants getting busy. You as a man, one attribute you need to have is you don't need to be supervised all the time. You don't always need to be told what to do. You can be a man and be proactive, find something to do, get busy, do your job without being told. Right? This is a good attribute of a faithful man. Luke 16. And you know what? If you're faithful, you'll be rewarded for it. Not only in this life, but in the next life too. This is a, this is a principle you ought to really take to heart. All of you. You know, when it comes to this world, don't buy in to the worldly mentality of entitlement and, you know, the world owes you a job, the world owes you a house, the world owes you this and that and this, and it should, it should be provided. It's a right for me to have these things. It's a right for me to have health care. It's a right for me to have a house. right for me to have these things. You can't have a right. Look, guys, you can't, I don't know where you guys stand on, but you can't have a right to somebody else's services. You know what I mean? Like when we talk about rights, this is like rights that inherit the things that you have. You have life, you have a right to your life, you have a right to your freedom, but you can't have a right to health care. Because you have a right to health care, well, somebody's got to provide you with that health care. You know, that's like saying, I have a right to have somebody cut my hair. I have a right for somebody to mow my lawn. Like, it's like, I have a right to have neat gardens. So, but then who's going to provide that service? So the same with health care. You can't have a right to health care. You know what I mean? You have, you have a right to your life, but you have a responsibility to take care of your own health. If you need help with that, then you need to pay for it. You know, somebody needs to provide that service to you. So when it comes to your life, you, know, you don't want to have this entitlement mentality. You need to understand that if you're faithful in small things, then you are given more responsibility. <clears throat> and that works the same in your job. It works the same in business. You know, you're faithful to your customers. Your first customer, you're going to get more customers. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So this principle applies in your job as much as it does to God. Right? So in your job, if you want to be promoted and you want to work your way up, or you want a successful business, you've got to be faithful in the little things. And then you will grow from there. And it's the same in the spiritual life. You know, if you're faithful in the small things, then more will be committed unto you, and also you'll be rewarded with more when you get to heaven. So faithfulness. Faithfulness is a, is a rare thing. You know, it's hard to find people that are de- you can depend on, that, that you can trust, that are consistent, and that, you know, are diligent. It's very hard to find. And that's why the Bible says, you know, but a faithful man... Who can find? Just like finding a virtuous woman is, is very rare as well. But this is what we should all be striving for. Now, number three, it's not only are you faithful, so you're loyal, you're faithful, you're diligent, but you're a hard worker as well. You work hard to provide for your family. You work hard on the job. You work hard at what you do. You work hard for the Lord. You know, sometimes doing things for the Lord is hard work. You know, but part of being a man is that you step up and you do some hard work. Second Thessalonians 3, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So what is it saying here? It's not only saying that if you don't work, then you're going to have nothing to eat because you won't be able to pay for your own food, but also because the church will provide people with food. And what I believe is saying here is if somebody's lazy in church, then one thing is that they're denied being able to eat with the church, right? So it's not that you just feed lazy people, right? It's feeding people that are needy and that maybe don't have the income, but it's not about feeding the lazy. This is, this is addressing people that are lazy. And this is why, you know, be careful with people that ask for money out on the street. You know, it's best to direct your money towards people that, you know, need your money, you know? But sometimes people on the street, they're just like professional beggars. And it's hard to sometimes determine who is and who isn't. But don't just feel an obligation anytime somebody asks you for money to give it to them because you don't want to necessarily encourage laziness either. 
For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So we don't want to be lazy men. We want to work hard and to provide for our family. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 5. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So if you don't work hard enough to provide for your family, the Bible says, hey, if you're not providing for your home, you're worse than an infidel. Now, does that mean people that fall on hard times and people that are trying their best to provide a worse than No. This is talking about people that are not fulfilling the responsibility or not, you know, not even trying to fulfill the responsibility they have to provide for their home because they are lazy. Right? So people that are lazy, you need to be hard working. Now, whenever I think of hard working, I always think of this passage in Acts 5. In Acts 5. And I'll just read through it and then I'll point you out a few things. But in Acts 5, this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the church about how much they gave. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. So she knew what was going on secretly as well. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So what was their sin? In Acts 5, was it that they didn't give all the money for the property that they sold to church? No, it was that they sold the property and then they lied about how much they gave. So maybe they sold the property for a million dollars and then they give like 600,000 to the church and then they said, oh, you know, we gave it all. You know, we sold it for 600,000. So when they gave all that money to that early church, Peter knew because of the Holy Ghost that they were lying about the amount that they had given, but they wanted the glory to be able to say, hey, well, we gave the whole amount. He says, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? He said, hey, nobody forced you to donate this. Nobody forced you to give this money, right? You wanted to do something for the Lord. It was yours, but why did you have to lie about it? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. So I think Ananias and Sapphira, I think they're saved, but I think God killed them here just as a punishment for their sin. And look here, this is where I want to point out. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. See, we have a problem nowadays that young men are lazy, right? They don't work hard. And this is something, you know, Chances are maybe they're lazy because their fathers were lazy too or maybe they got the wrong role models in their life. But a lot of young men these days are lazy. You know, and we don't want to raise a generation of lazy people, a, a lazy men. And if we want to do that, we have to be hardworking ourselves. Right? So we don't want to be lazy people because we don't want to have the example given to other people that are lazy. So you see here, the young men here, what are they doing? They're doing the hard work here. They carry, I mean, it's quite hard to carry a dead body and also to bury him, right? So they're digging a hole and they're burying him. And it was about the space of three hours after. So you can see this is about three hours work, right? That they go out, they dig this hole, they bury this man. And it says about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea. For so much so she agreed to uh, the same price right that her husband said then peter said unto her, how is it that you've agreed together to tempt the spirit of the lord behold the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out so what is he saying here in verse 9 it's like well not only did your husband lie but you guys didn't even have the sense to go you know what we shouldn't lie to the church about how much we gave. One of you says, hey, you've actually agreed together to lie to the church and tempt the Spirit of the Lord uh, about this matter. Verse 10, Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth and buried her by her husband. So you see how the young men here are doing the hard work. This is what we want in our church. We want the men to be active, doing the hard work, doing the heavy lifting for
for the stuff we need to do here in church. Not the ladies, right? The ladies often in a, a lot of churches, and sometimes it happens in this church, the ladies are doing all the work, right? The ladies are doing all the cleaning up and the packing up and everything like that. Hey, men have to get involved too. We have to help set up, pack down, clean up. Everyone needs to get involved. Let's not have a generation of lazy men so we don't raise a generation of lazy men as well. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. So we need to look like a man. You've got to be faithful, be a hard worker. Number four is you show yourself a man. A real man is a teacher. A real man is a teacher. Right? It's not, oh, go ask your mom about these things. You know, go ask your mom, go look at, you know, brush, you know, off, all that sort of stuff. No, we need to be teachers as well. So we need to know what we're talking about so we can teach it. And you know, when, when you want to teach something, you need to know it better than just like a general knowledge. Because in order to teach and explain something, you have to know something, you have to understand something quite well. So to be a teacher, that means men have to do the diligence to actually know things and understand things to be able to teach it to somebody else, not just to repeat it. Ephesians 6 Look what it says here. And ye fathers, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it's not only the women that are in charge of teaching the children. You say, well, I'm going to homeschool my children. Oh, my wife's going to homeschool them. Yeah, sure. I'm, I, I, I have no problem with the wife being the teacher at home and raising the children and teaching them. But that doesn't absolve you of your responsibility to also bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't think of homeschooling as like a handball, you know, to, to your wife, that your wife is just going to do everything. You also need to take some responsibility to teach your children the things of the Lord. Help them to understand certain concepts. Talk to them and teach them things. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, wisdom, beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear... My son, look at this, hear the instruction of thy father. So the assumption here is that there is instruction coming from thy father in order for you to hear, right? So us as fathers ought to have some instruction to give our children and forsake not the law of thy mother. And hopefully the instruction we give our children is not just vain traditions and things like that. It's actually biblical commands biblical explanations and biblical reasoning for why we live the way we do. For they shall be an ornament uh, of... Oh, I might not have actually copied the rest of that verse there. Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Here's another one. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Look at this. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So you see how there's an exhortation here for the people of Israel to teach not only their children, but also their grandchildren. So let's keep that in mind, guys. I know a lot of us here are not grandparents yet, but don't think, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, they get this mindset, oh, you know, I've, I've done my battles, it's your turn now. You know, I've raised my children, it's your turn to deal with your own children. No, that's not the mindset of a godly man. Right? The mindset of a godly man is, hey, I have a responsibility not only to influence my children, but to try and influence my grandchildren as well. And hopefully, you know, you have a good enough relationship with your children, right, that they will let you and will welcome you to teach and help teach their children. Right? So have that good relationship with your children so that, you know, because you know what it's like when you have children and you clash with your parents. So just consider that, you know, reflect on your own experiences in your life and think about the sort of parent you want to be so that when you come to your son or daughter-in-law or daughter's house, that they're like, ah, you know, that's the sort of parent I want to be. Like when I come to my children's house, they're like, ah, oh, thank God. Dad's here, mom's here, help out, they're supportive, you know, and they can help me out rather than constantly clashing. So hopefully that's the case with my children as well when, we, when they grow up. Look here, this is an example here in Joshua. This is when they pass over uh, the River Jordan. 
And the story here is they all carry these stones over from one side to the other. And then they put this pile of stones on the other side of the river. And it signifies something. But I want you to show, I want you to show here. It says here, I want you to notice this in this story. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them. So who's answering them? The fathers. But the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So notice here, it's not when the children ask their mothers, and would they ask their mothers? I'm sure they would. But who was primarily responsible to remind the sons and the sons' sons when your children ask their fathers in time to come? saying, what mean ye by these stones? You can see how the father does take a teaching role in the sense that he's responsible for teaching his family the ways of the Lord and to be that example to them. Now, the last one I want to cover is a, you know, a godly man, a man that shows himself a man, is a leader is a leader. We talked a bit about this you know, a couple of weeks ago and we talked about how to have an obedient wife. But God made man to be the leader. Right? So the man is the leader in the family. So obviously being a godly man, showing yourself a man and being that example, you need to step up and be that leader. So men are to lead, not only in the family, Ephesians 5, wives submit to yourselves, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So you see how it's, it's not just the husband's responsibility to lead, it's also the woman's responsibility to follow, right? So there's two aspects here. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord, right? As unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So in the family, husband is in charge. Even at the, in the church, man is in charge. There, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So notice, the bishop must be a husband, not a wife of one husband. Right. So this is why men are only appointed to the office of bishop and deacon are in charge at church. And not only that, but in society. We see here, we covered this before in Isaiah 3.12, there's a problem in a society. Look at see what it says here. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy path. So you see, when a nation is not going well, children are oppressing and also women rule over them and you can see this not only happens in nations because nations if you think about it are just families you know and then nations are just a collection of families right and a church is the same a church is just a collection of families it's like a nation within a nation it's god's nation or sort of a tribe within god's nation but you can see sometimes this happens as well within families where children are in charge. Children are the boss. Children tell their parents what to do. The parents are always trying to appease the children. You know, like, what can I offer you today so that you will, like, make my life easier, you know? This is what some parents are like, and you see them. You know, we need to step up and be a leader and lead our home, not let our children just tell us to do whatever they want. We work by their schedule. No, the, the attitude in your household is you don't tell us how this house is run. We tell you what the schedule is. We tell you how things are run. You're the child. I'm the parent. And it's the same with you, your, your wife. You need to have this understanding. And obviously there are two sides. With you. you know, One side is sometimes you've got to come down hard. And other times, you know, in order for you to be able to come down hard, you've got to balance it with love. But you know, does this not just describe today's dysfunctional family? You know, children get whatever they want. 
children are just catered for, children are you know, almost worshipped, and just like, you know, whatever, you know, our schedule, we just go, go by whatever the children want, whatever the children want to do, and matriarchal families, the women making all the decisions. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the age-old joke of like, oh, God, I'll ask the boss. You know, that joke comes because this is, this is what happens when people get away from God. You know, godly people don't say, I got to check with the boss because they know who the boss is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I know who the boss is. I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm consulting my wife, but I'm not, like, getting her approval. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm consulting so I can make a decision for the family. Uh, I don't need her um, approval biblically. Right? If you're a leader. Now, to be a good leader, you need to be a good follower. And this is why every good leader is a good follower. Because ultimately, when we lead, we are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And this just sort of ties it all together. Because when we started, hey, how was Solomon to show himself a man? By keeping the commandments of the Lord. Right? So ultimately, we are a leader by following the ultimate leader, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So can you say this of yourself? I mean, Paul said to his followers, be ye followers of me, even as I, even as I also am of Christ. Can you say this about yourself? Can you say to somebody else, hey, follow me. Hey, you want to know how to live the Christian life? Just watch my life. Live it how I live it. Just copy me. This is what Paul is saying. Man, I hope, you know, I, I mean, I like to think I can say this, but, you know, I, I don't think I would be at Paul's standard. But this is what we strive for. You know, when you think about your own life, don't just think, oh, yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as those people. The question is, could you say to somebody else, hey, you want to live a godly Christian life? Do what I do. Live it the way I live it. Do what I'm doing. You know, raise your family this way. Live how I live. Speak how I live. Dress how I dress. If you just copy me, you'll be following Christ. That's what you want to be able to say to somebody else. That's the standard you should be going for. Not, I'm not as bad as that person who doesn't go to church and like, you know, these worldly people. You know, that's, that, that standard is too low. All <laughs> right? The standard we are seeking for is the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you get people to follow you? Yes, you know, you can try and demand it and whatnot. If you remember that sermon I preached, how to have an obedient wife? Hey, you want people to respect you. You want people to follow you. Hey, be somebody worthy of respect. Be somebody worth following. You know, take a stand. If you want to be a leader, you've got to be in front. Right? So when you lead, you can't lead from behind. You've got to lead in front. So that means you've got to be ahead. You've got to have more knowledge, more zeal. Be doing things first. You know? And you have to do that both physically and spiritually, right? So in how you work physically and also how your knowledge spiritually as well. Because ultimately, we are all followers. So if we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can tell people to get behind us. So in conclusion, what example do your children have to follow as a father? What is your example? I mean, can you look at your children in the face and say, hey, live a Christian life, do it as I do it, even if you don't have children, what sort of example would you set for another believer? You know, can you say to another believer, live how I live and you will live a godly Christian life? If you can't do that, you've got to keep growing. You've got to get to that point where you can be a good example to somebody else. Because if you know what? If you're not a good example, then that means you're being a bad example. Right? If you can't say, hey, at least move in the direction I'm going, then what direction are you pushing them? What direction is your example pushing them? Can you say, follow me as I follow Christ? Because you know what? If we want to raise godly men, guys, we have to be a godly man first. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for the reminder this morning to be a godly man. Lord, help the men of this church to show themselves a man, not in the way the world shows themselves a man. Lord, help us to abhor and have a hatred, a godly hatred for those things that the world finds manly. But Lord, we pray that we will glorify, we will strive for the things that you find manly, both in appearance 
faithfulness, being a leader, being a hard worker, and being a teacher to our families, uh, not only by our word, but by our example. So, Lord, help us. We need your grace. It's not an easy task, but help us to strive for perfection. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.